Hey everybody, welcome to our talk, Adventures in Mitem Lab, using Mitem to attack Active Directory authentication schemes. So uh, first, uh, let me introduce us. Uh, I'm Yaron, uh, manager uh, on the engineering team at CrowdStrike. I've pr uh, presented two times before at Black Hat and one time at DEF CON. Uh, did a lot of research on authentication protocols. Uh, Eyal, uh, an engineer, uh, previously presented on Black Hat, and uh, Segi, also an engineer uh, with extensive background as a security researcher as, uh, on many uh, organizations. So uh, what is this talk about? So this talk is about uh, an extensive research that we did to see what we can achieve if we have a machine in the middle. So a uh, machine in the middle is a technique that uh, has a lot of potential. One slide back. So uh, that has a lot of potential. Uh, so if uh, uh, you're at a pen test or a, 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 an attack, and you uh, uh, reach a point where you have no uh, credentials and no zero days. Uh, sometimes a man in the middle is a, a great technique to move laterally inside a subnet. And the, our area of focus for this research was Active Directory. And Active Directory uh, has very old protocols and by default, most of the protocols don't use TLS, but rely on Windows authentication. Um, so let's begin with a, a short introduction to, Kerber, to Kerberos and NTLM, which are the AD authentication protocols. So in NTLM, a, a client machine wants to authenticate to a server, so it sends an a NTLM negotiate request. The server creates a nonce and sends it in, in a challenge request, and the client machine signs the nonce with, uh, uh, with, uh, with the user's password. Uh, the server does not know how to validate the user password, so it over the NetLogon channel, it sends uh, the NTLM authenticate message, and the DC either approves or rejects uh, the user authentication by validating the user password. Now uh, on to Kerberos. So uh, with Kerberos, the client machine first logs, uh, the user first logs in, and in order to log in, the client machine sends an AS request, which for that it gets back a TGT, a ticket granting ticket. Now using that ticket granting ticket, uh, the machine requests a TGS rec, which is a ticket granting service and the DC gets a ticket, the ticket, the ticket granting service is signed with the server's password, not the user's password. And now uh, when the client machine connects uh, to the server uh, over any channel, the channel can be SMB or LDAP or HTTP, uh, it will send a Kerberos message, which is called AP request, and would send the TGS, the ticket granting uh, service, one more click, and the server is able to authenticate the ticket since the service ticket is signed with the server's password. So um, as you can see, uh, uh, Kerberos offers a lot more security than NTLM. Uh, there's plenty of material online uh, for any of the attacks or issues that I've mentioned here. One most critical issue with NTLM is that NTLM allows for NTLM relay, um, which is also worth a short introduction. Uh, so with NTLM relay, uh, the setting is that a client wants to connect to a server. Uh, the server is compromised uh, and uh, the attacker on the server wants to use the credentials from the client machine to attack another target another server, so it relays the negotiate message to the server and to the attack target. The attack target uh, sends an end, the, the challenge back, uh, 
uh, with, the, with a nonce. This is relayed to the client machine back. The client machine signs the nonce with the user uh, um, secret. The server relays that NTLM authenticate message. The attack target would validate it over the netlog on channel and the DC would approve it since it's the user's uh, correct secret and the attack would succeed. Um, so there's plenty of network and plenty of research on NTLM relay. Uh, one talk you might want to review is a, a, a talk in DEF CON I did with Marina Simakov in, in 2019, which uh, really dives deep into NTLM relay uh, internals. And with that, I'll pass the stage to Eyal. Okay, thanks, Yaron. Uh, as Yaron mentioned, uh, NTLM relay only works if the server does not enforce a signing or encryption on the target. Sylvan found that one could authenticate to a certain RPC interface, the task scheduler, and it does not enforce signing on the graphic. It's even written in the specs. So using the classical technique of NPLM relay, one could relay the authentication to the server and afterwards send an unsigned packet that would cause it to run an arbitrary task. This would result effectively in a remote code execution vulnerability. What allowed this attack is the way that RPC handles security. The level of security in RPC session is determined by the authentication level of it. Some RPC servers require packet privacy. That means required that the session would be encrypted, while other only require a packet integrity that is signing. The authentication requirement is determined on an interface by interface basis. In fact, the registration API requires the caller to set up a special function to check for security requirements for, a, for a, an advocate authentication level. It does not rely as one would expect on the SMB, SMB signing settings on, 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 on other uh, secure defaults. You see, when an interface allows for a packet for authentication level of connect, it would be vulnerable to NTLM relay anywhere uh, on any computer, even on a DC. The question is, uh, does this interface has a potential security impact? And uh, indeed, while most of the interfaces implemented by Microsoft in Windows are protected, there might be some uh, instances where the developer neglected this thing. So uh, now we switch to a very different vulnerability and we'll see how it is related. And uh, one of the uh, recent vulnerabilities uh, involving print fuller, one should say one of the many, many recent vulnerabilities of print spooler uh, was discovered by uh, Pele Gadar and Tomer Bar. And uh, in this vulnerability, you exploit a, a lack of access check in order to achieve a, a, pre, a writing arbitrary files in the system. So how does it work? Uh, to print something, one needs to specify which printer, printing driver and by which port it communicates with the printer. The current implementation allows for any user to install a, printing, a print driver, a printer driver, and uh, also, of course, to print. So the simplest driver there, there is is called a generic text driver that simply passes the input it gets uh, into the port. Well, the port could be something like uh, COM1 or COM2 where the printer is connected to. It can also be a file. And uh, what, and uh, 
this means that the user can uh, call call this simple printer to print to a file it wants. But what makes all of this a vulnerability is that the access checks were done from a certain uh, execution path, but uh, it was on the client side. So all of this allows um, effectively a local privilege escalation in which an unprivileged user can write a file and a file to important location who doesn't have privileges to do so. So uh, instead of relying on uh, the document, okay, now we switch to our uh, contribution. And uh, instead of relying on uh, the documentation of the RBC interfaces like Peleg and Toner D, we develop a small scanning tool to allow us to find additional vulnerable interfaces. One of the result was uh, the print spoiler interface. And uh, we know from previous slides that the uh, print spoiler interface could allow one to write arbitrary files. Even after it is fixed, uh, one could write files if it has sufficient privilege. So, we can combine a both, both vulnerabilities or both our insight into a working exploit. So notice that the setting of uh, the previous vulnerability 1048, our local privileged and privileged user, but we start from a setting of remote privileged user that contact a certain server and we relay this a request, as whatever the request is, to another server uh, using MTLM relay. And the, what we execute on, on, the, on, the, on the target server is similar to what, to what happened in the original vulnerability. So let's see how it's done. First, uh, we have a, an authentication request uh, by the client machine that uh, is passed to a rock server. And now we create a channel with the target server, we as the attacker, and we bind to the print scholar interface. We relay the authentication and get a challenge that we relay to a client back. And the client sends us the response to the challenge. We relate back to the DC. So now it verify. Now it has an authenticated session that uh, is valid, and we can send uh, commands without encrypted encryption to this session. Now we first install a printer driver. Then we do uh, all the things that you need. We add a port, we install a printer, and we start to write to a file. And uh, that is it. Now we can uh, see the demo. Okay, so what happens here is that uh, we first use a Metasploit. We use here a endpoint mapping uh, query, and uh, we list all the different uh, RPC interface that we see on the remote computer. This remote computer is a DC. And uh, we see here we have uh, many interface. interfaces. Some of them are uh, local RPC, and the uh, others are uh, remote. And uh, now we just uh, reformat the output so it will match a script that we are about to run. And what this script will do is it will try to uh, try different uh, interfaces, the same that we found earlier, and it will send a, it will connect send a garbage packet. And using this packet, we can know uh, okay, we can know uh, if it's vulnerable. Now you see we found the a printer's print scholar interface there. 
and it is, uh, the error code is unsupported, and we have another interface with error of bad stub data. The error of bad stub data means that uh, the server handled this garbage and it, it, it understands that it's garbage and so it rejects it. Uh, the unsupported error on the other end is simply uh, inconclusive and uh, it actually requires an additional, that we send an additional object ID for it to work. So once we did that, we found that the principle is indeed vulnerable and now I can show you the second demo, which is uh, how to do NTLM relay to, uh, to, to the print spooler and write a file. Uh, we do it against uh, DC, and uh, we see here that uh, we first uh, open our man in the middle server, and uh, the client uh, access SharePoint uh, it types the, its username and password, and we will shortly see that in the target computer, a file is being written. So we write a file to the sysvol volume, which would be present on any computer on the network. So this would allow one to take over the domain. And uh, now I, I pass, uh, now uh, following me is Sagi and uh, he will discuss uh, his vulnerability. So uh, actually, uh, Yaron is speaking now. <laughs> so um, now I want to highlight uh, another vulnerability that was not discovered by us. It was discovered on uh, 2015 by uh, Luke Jennings uh, and Luke Jennings essentially researched the GPO retrieval process uh, and uh, wondered what would happen if a meetem would attack uh, that scenario and he actually found many uh, attacks that can be uh, uh, done uh, one attack is actually still exploitable, which is that if you have a low privileged user and a meetem, you could uh, manipulate the GPO using the credentials and inject a malicious GPO. Uh, the other one uh, is an attack that requires only meetem and uses MTLM. And in that attack, uh, which Microsoft actually fixed, is an attack that we want to focus on since we've improved uh, this attack and found new avenues to, to attack it. So um, if we have a client machine and the client machine uh, wishes to uh, download GPOs, it would perform an add that bind. And then uh, if the GPO retrieval is uh, authenticated with NTLM, an NTLM negotiate message would appear. And uh, since we're intercepting this request, uh, instead of the DC, we will send an uh, NTLM challenge request and would name the, uh, the target name as the rogue server. Uh, the client machine does not authenticate uh, or validate the NTLM challenge. And even though the machine initially uh, connect, connected the DC, uh, it doesn't reject a request uh, uh, where the NTLM challenge names another machine as the target and just send an NTLM authenticate message uh, uh, with the rogue server name. Now, our machine can, uh, uh, in its own uh, NetLogon challenge, send the NTLM authenticate and the DC would respect this request since uh, the target of the request is reported to be our rogue server. And the DC would send us back a reply and uh, the reply would have the session key. So now we have a session key and we can send an accept complete signaling the client it can uh, send requests over the LDAP uh, channel. And even though the request uh, might be signed or sealed, even if the requests are signed or sealed, uh, 
they are signed and sealed with the session key that we know, and we can send back uh, any malicious response that we like. In the original vulnerability, uh, the response was a redirect stating that the GPOs are at some uh, malicious UNC that's uh, on our control. Now, uh, this exact attack can happen on LDAP as we displayed, but you can let the LDAP uh, uh, be relayed to the DC without any manipulation. And then when the client machine downloads using SMB, the GPO files themselves, uh, we can do the same technique over SMB. So how has Microsoft fixed that issue? So now the default is that group policy objects cannot be downloaded using NTLM and there's a new registry key for that. And for the SMB case, Microsoft even went uh, uh, deeper. Uh, they've added a new configuration called hardened UNC paths. And that configuration uh, basically forces Kerberos authentication and not NTLM for any UNC over SMB that uh, is uh, on a file on some regexes. Uh, the default uh, for this configuration is that the, uh, there's a sysvol regex and a netlogon regex, and this actually uh, stops uh, any chance of intervening with uh, the group policy uh, download uh, process. And uh, with that, I'll uh, pass the stage back to Eyal, uh, who's going to present our new uh, attacks. Okay, uh, thank you. So now we will discuss a bit uh, Azure AD Connect. And the uh, Azure AD Connect is part of the uh, vision of uh, Microsoft of Siemens Sign On. So uh, in this perspective, uh, where a user uh, that uh, is connected to the web uh, can use uh, its internal uh, compute company credentials to access uh, some external resources like Office 365 or some internal application without uh, needing a VPN. So how does it work? Uh, it works by uh, synchronizing uh, the important Active Directory data to the cloud uh, with the help of a special uh, server that is called the uh, AD Connect server. The server connects to a domain controller, replicates the password and other data, and uh, then it exports its hash to the Active uh, to the Azure Active Directory. Uh, I, uh, however, one needs to make sure that it is actually talking to the right domain controller. For instance, it could do it by picking a protocol that supports mutual authentication and certainly not working in NTLM. So what happens there is that a traffic that meant to the original DC might end up in a rogue server and the things would work just fine as uh, Yaron demonstrated. So uh, what we need to assume for this attack to work is a full man in the middle, including DNS, Kerberos, DCRPC. And, uh, and then we uh, first make Kerberos fail and allowing LDAP uh, to pass to the DC, we relate to the, to the actual DC, and we wait for a domain replication. When it occurs, we inject a new chain that involves a new password for an account of our choice, and afterwards uh, it syncs with the, with the Azure AD, and we can log in into Azure AD with the injected password. So let's see the demo. Okay, so what happens here is we have a, first, we want to change the password into NTLM injection. Now we see that the password of this user, EK test is now not NTLM injection, but other passwords. 
and we have two windows here. One, the first one contains a, a modified version of Mimikex. Uh, in this modified version, we specified the target user and the password that we want. And the other window is doing simply forwarding elder traffic to the DC. And now uh, I adjusted the speed, the speed of the demo so we can, uh, we can see what happened. Uh, the interesting part, and uh, so it took around a minute or uh, two minutes until we get to it. And uh, now uh, we got to it and uh, we see that uh, it pulled our uh, fake change and uh, we can uh, now log in and with our new password, hopefully it will work. Let's see. Okay, so it doesn't work. Let's try again. Still doesn't work. Yeah, it sometimes takes time for the, um, the synchronization to occur. And we see that uh, it got the sign on request okay, and we have access to Office. So now we can uh, look at the traffic itself and we can see the bind packet, which is directed to our uh, ROG server that is that for workstation 01. And indeed that is the response that it uh, returns. And we can also see uh, the LDAP uh, bind packet that are all a return from the DC itself. And uh, you can see it here. So uh, that really concludes uh, the demo. Thanks a lot. And now uh, Sagi will continue. Now let's talk a bit about Kerberos Relay. Uh, it's basically the same scenario as the uh, anti just with Kerberos. So a client wants to connect to some service uh, in the target server, and as part of that, it sends an AP request. The attacker intercepts that AP request using uh, some uh, meeting technique and uh, uses, this, uses it to establish a session of its own against the target server with the client's credential. Since the AP request is uh, valid and uh, was actually intended for the target server, it will work. Uh, this will, uh, of course, this will work uh, only if the signing uh, and encryption flags are not, are, are turned off inside the AP request, or the protocol the attacker chooses uh, supports turning those off uh, as part of the protocol negotiation. Also, this works uh, against most services since uh, most of them do not validate the, the service principal name and any, any SPN can be used. Uh, let's see a specific example uh, using SMB relay. An attacker will intercept some AP request that was made to a target server and then uh, establish a new SMB session of its own against the same target server while negotiating signing and uh, encryption off. Then uses the same uh, AP request it intercepted to authenticate in that SMB session and uh, basically get an SMB session with the client's credentials. And uh, of course, this will, as I said, work only if the target server does not enforce uh, signing and encryption. And uh, uh, as you can uh, understand, the, the solution for this problem, for the kernel scaling problem, is turning on, as I said, signing or encryption, uh, which is uh, done in the protocol level and uses a shared secret that is negotiated inside the AP request and response process. Okay, so uh, encryption in the protocol level solves the relay problem, but what happens 
when we use the TLS characters. Since the encryption is done in the transport layer, there is no connection to the underlying authentication in the protocol, and uh, we get a new relay problem. So this is where EPA comes into play. Using EPA, we couple the authentication process to the, under, to the TLS channel using the certificate fountain that was presented during the TLS channel negotiation. Uh, the fountain is inserted in, inside uh, the checksum field of the AP request authenticator and servers that support EPA, uh, EPA use that field to validate that the certificate hash that was presented during the TLS negotiation is in fact their own, and if not, they reject this, uh, this connection. Uh, EPA is used in uh, many important services like LDAP, ADFS, and the IS, and it usually requires to, for full enforcement, full enforcement, it requires uh, some settings to be turned on, and uh, usually they are not on by default. Uh, so can we bypass uh, EPA? Of course, for an example of an LTLM bypass, again, check out your ones and the Marina stock from DEFCON 19. And as for Kerberos, let's see what happens when we don't include the, the checks and field inside the AP request. So uh, here's an example of uh, uh, L.S. Uh, pickup. Uh, of course, it's uh, decrypted, so <laughs> that's why you see the traffic. Um, here we took a regular LP request that was generated by a Windows client and we tried to relate uh, inside the LDAPS session and to authenticate uh, with it to the DC. The DC is set to fully enforce EPA and as you can see, uh, the Windows client included a zeroed out hash in the checksum field and the DC verified the hash. Obviously, it's, all, it's not its own hash, so uh, the DC rejected the connection. Now, in this pickup, with, uh, which is also an uh, LDAPS decrypted uh, network traffic, we, we took, we relayed an AP request that was generated by IAM packet, which was, by default does not include the checksum field. Uh, we relayed it to the same DC that is set to impose EPA. And as you can see, since the checksum field is not there, the DC approved the connection and answered our, uh, our LDAP search. And obviously, for that attack scenario to work, we need to find a vulnerable client in the network that does not include the checksum field inside the authenticator. Now let's talk about KDC spoofing. Uh, it's a very old technique that usually used to bypass authentication server. So the basic scenario goes like this. A user authenticates to a server using plain text credentials, of course, usually over some encrypted channel like SSH or HTTPS. The server takes that credentials and using, the, using it, it creates an AP request. An attacker intercepts that AP request and returns a fake uh, TGT, a fake ticket. Uh, and now the server has no ability to validate the TGT. And uh, since it got one, it just approved the connection of the user and the user is uh, logged on. Uh, now let's see how the, this problem was solved. We begin with the same basic scenario. A user uh, authenticates to the server with plain text credentials. An AP request is generated. DC returns uh, a valid TGT. And as I said, the server has no ability to validate that ticket. At this part, the server uses uh, the, the TGT to ask for a service ticket uh, to itself. The DC uh, approves that request and returns the TGS that is intended to the server. Uh, and with that, the server decrypts the TGS, validates that uh, his own secret, secret was actually used to decrypt, uh, to sign the ticket. And thus it can validate that the DC uh, 
uh, is a is a genuine district. Now let's see how it looks in the traffic. Uh, here in this scenario, a user logged on to a workstation and AP requ an AS request was generated. The DC returned the TGT, and then that workstation used that TGT to ask for a service ticket to itself, in this case with a, the host SPN. Uh, usually in this scenario, the host SPN will, will be used. So we can manipulate TGS and TGT. TGTs. So what can we do? Let's look at the DC selection process. Uh, in this process, the machine does some uh, unsecure queries using mostly LDAP and uh, DNS, also some uh, CLDAP, uh, until it's, it gets enough information and can decide what what this is that is best for it. As, as I said, until this stage, all, all queries are done, are done unsecured and can be tampered with. Now, at this point, a standard Windows client will create a network one channel against the chosen DC and send some mes messages over it. This step is the most important one since the creation of a network one ch uh, channel actually validates the DC, since uh, for establishing the channel, the target server must know the client machine secret. So if uh, this channel was established correctly and at least one message passed, it means that uh, the target server, the server is a genuine DC. So what, what does it mean? It means that as, as long as the target server or service does not validate the DC, using network on or other means, it means we can interject in the process and inject a rogue DC of our own, and then serve data to the target, data like LDAP, SMB, or uh, DCRPC traffic. Let's see the attack scenario. A client machine boots up and uh, wants to select a DC. As I said, we can intervene in the process since it's done uh, totally unsecured and we inject our own work DC. Now, as long as the target uh, server or service does not validate uh, the DC, when a user uh, logs in, uh, the same process we discussed earlier begins. The machine creates an S request. We take this S request related to the DC and relate back the response. Now, the verification of the uh, DC by uh, the host request to, uh, the, to the machine begins. Again, we uh, re relay this message to the DC and the response back to the client. And since this actual and actual DC serves those requests, uh, the machine gets a valid ticket and approves the user for login. Now at this stage, usually machines or servers will uh, actually want to know more details about the user, such as display name, group memberships, uh, profile paths, and other data. So uh, usually an LDAP session will be initiated. Uh, this session is of course established against the DC, which in this case is our work DC. So a service ticket to the work DC will be asked. We will relay this uh, request to the DC and return back a genuine TGS for the rock DC. At this point, since uh, a, a TGS is used, uh, the, the target for it is our rock DC, we can serve any protocol so, uh, such as LDAP, SMB, or DCRPC, uh, signed or encrypted. So let's say in this scenario, the machine will uh, initiate an LDAP search. We will uh, approve it and uh, get <laughs> return responses with malicious data, such as a wrong group memberships or uh, uh, pro malicious profile paths and uh, any other example. Uh, so what do we need for that attack scenario? We need a service that uses kernels that ingests data from the DC uh, that does not have a fixed DC configuration, 
And of course, we need meeting between that uh, server, server and the DC. And we need that service to know to validate the DC uh, using network one or other means. The attack, so the attack itself, we're using meeting, we redirect uh, the traffic to our own DC. And every time uh, the client uh, wants to uh, uh, query the DC, it queries us, and we can inject any data we want. Uh, so this to work, we need to, so our work DC to have registered SPNs like LDAP or some other stuff we might need. Okay, so how can we protect against this attack? Uh, we should only use servers and services that use either network one uh, to validate the DC or use LWS with the certificate validation. It is also possible to turn on Kermos armoring, though we haven't tested it fully, so we, we can <laughs> vouch for that. And as a side note, uh, Windows GPO is still safe since the window, Windows GPO client only uh, pulls uh, GPO after there is a valid uh, network on session against the, tar the target DC. If there is not one, the GPO client will not pull any GPO. Now, we wanted to show you demos of uh, this attack. But unfortunately, the vendors we work with uh, weren't able to fully fix the problem yet. And so stay tuned for updates. And as a side note, this uh, particular problem is pretty common uh, in a Linux client and basically uh, any non-Windows uh, uh, native clients. Uh, so uh, let's get back to uh, Yaron. Okay, so uh, we have shown you basically uh, four issues, uh, an NTLM relay, an NTLM injection, and a Kerberos relay and a Kerberos injection. For the NTLM relay, um, Microsoft has fixed the issue that we've reported. Um, we've also noted that there might be other open interfaces and Microsoft actually asked for uh, any interface we found it to be exploitable to report separately. And we've not had the, uh, the proper time to investigate each interface. Uh, for the Azure AD, Microsoft actually says that Meetem is basically not a security boundary. Um, I, I can actually understand their point since Azure AD uh, sits uh, in the data center and the DC should also sit in the data center. So that connection should probably be more secure. But if this connection is not secure on your network, you should probably have it secured. Um, for the channel bindings issue, the uh, uh, Kerberos over TLS, so Microsoft has chosen not to fix uh, this issue. Um, and for the Kerberos injection, as Segi mentioned, that issue is probably very widespread and we've notified a few vendors uh, and you can expect updates uh, soon. So uh, closing remarks. So um, uh, when we started this research, uh, we uh, weren't sure if how seriously would our meet and vulnerabilities be taken. And we can see that uh, in some cases, uh, MITEM is not considered a security vulnerability or a security boundary, I'm sorry. Um, and like technically what we shown you is that uh, Kerberos is not validating DC identity properly, if not using NetLogon, which is not always the case. And uh, GSS API encryption simply does not guarantee privacy in NTLM that's by design and in Kerberos if no NetLogon is uh, performed and basically just uh, protecting protocols from meeting is hard. Uh, you need to carefully uh, validate that any parties are uh, pro completely authenticated and uh, when you're using uh, external libraries and protocols that's not always easy to ascertain. So a couple of tips uh, for defenders. So 
obviously you should uh, harden your networks, uh, uh, enable server signing and client signing when server signing and client signing are not enabled uh, or not enforced, then uh, a lot easier attacks, a lot simpler attacks are able to be achieved. You should regularly patch your software and you should treat uh, critical servers like uh, Azure AD Connect uh, the same way you would a DC. The connection should probably be secured. Maybe it uh, should be over secure sockets. Um, for the Kerberos injection, basically what Sagi showed is that uh, in order to launch the attack, then you need to uh, register the LDAP SPN on a machine that is not a DC. So this is something you can hunt for to look for a successful or attacks or attack uh, attempts. And uh, jokes aside, uh, avoid uh, the Microsoft recommendation that you should not be MITEM. So MITEM is a technique that uh, often can be mitigated by properly configuring your network uh, equipment. You need to turn on uh, mitigations for ARP spoofing, for DHCP spoofing, for Slack. Th these are uh, mitigations that are known to work well so there's plenty of resources out there on how to protect yourself from meetings. You need to patch your uh, network equipment. And uh, that's it. Uh, thanks for listening to our talk. We hope you enjoyed it.